we're ready to start. Let's see, this is Wednesday, our third day of uh, reproduction. Before I forget, yesterday most of the lecture didn't get record, recorded. Uh, so maybe only the last 10, 15 minutes will show up on the website. The problem is <coughs> I have to work things backwards because it's in the cabinet. Usually if you get behind a camera, you can do better, but I can't get into the cabinet. So I do things by touch back there and I probably pushed the wrong button. And uh, that's the way it goes. So anyway, so just the last <coughs> bit from yesterday. I think it's recording now, but you really never know until you, uh, you get behind the camera or put it in the computer. That's the way it goes. If you were here, you got everything anyway. So, anybody have any burning questions? Hopefully you're watching those videos because you know it talks about the Esther cycle, the cat, dog, and horse, and those are three different animals. I mean, my gosh. Uh, uh, you almost couldn't plan it better to have like three different ways Esther cycles happen. Today I'm gonna concentrate on the cow because the cow is very straightforward and it's amazing but yeah so anybody have any questions on anything here we go can you go over the glands that are part of the like on one of your videos you kind of briefly cover the glands that are part of the male's anatomy can you go over those a little more sure that? sure sure <coughs> so let me let me look up um, what you're referring to is the accessory sex glands, I think. You know, and one of the most famous ones is the prostate. So let me look that up on Google because that's our best textbook. Because I really like how many images you can get rather than get a textbook. You're limited to whatever that author decided to show you. So uh, accessory sex glands. And see how it's somebody else searched in the mail. I'll click on that too. And then we'll see what happens. And of course, here's the other thing is I could never teach like third grade. What if you search for some of these things? You know how nasty it can get, right? Because I mean, sex glands, yeah. it's a little bit risky, but we're all adults here. <coughs> and I'll pick out one that I like here. Let's see if I can get that one bigger. It's going to get a little fuzzy, but that's okay. Okay, so here's, I know in one of the videos I drew, you know, made a drawing too, and I saw somebody had it already up here. So here's the kicker. It's a little uh, fuzzy, but if you know this stuff, I've never seen probably this before. It looks like it's probably based on human anatomy. <coughs> Sorry. Let me take you through this as soon as I get my voice back. Yesterday we talked about the testes. There's two of them, right? And then there's this structure on the testes that's adhered to the outside, and it's called the epididymis. And there it is right there, there's the spelling. <coughs> you can actually take a scissor, and I've done this, and cut right, starting right here, and you can take it apart away from the testes, and there's no blood vessels or anything that's from the testes over to this part. It's just connective tissue. <clears throat> and then you could actually cut here, but this is where the blood vessels and sperm are gonna leave the testes and enter the epididymis. But I know at Nebraska we had a big study with boars and we were actually take, taking the epididymis off and weighing it. Because at a certain age, boars with a heavier epididymis would be making more sperm. <coughs> more advanced. And of course we were weighing the testes too and all that. So then you have the sperm in the epididymis that stores, and this is a little review of yesterday, stores and matures the sperm. And then it goes into this ductus deferens, and that's another name for the vas deferens. If you know anybody that gets a vasectomy, this is cut right here. And there are surgeons that can put the two ends back together because then you can reverse the vasectomy. <coughs> but now we got sperm on both sides. Everything's bilateral. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> 
So to this point, we only have sperm, a very concentrated amount of sperm, and it's gonna be a minor part of the semen because semen equals sperm plus seminal plasma. Okay, the semen sample that you collect equals sperm fraction plus what's called seminal plasma. <coughs> and who makes the seminal plasma, which is the largest portion of the semen sample? It's the accessory sex glands. So accessory sex glands make a lot of fluid that gets dumped into the lumen of the uh, reproductive tract at the time of ejaculation. So we got the sperm here, and it's going to come, uh, the vas deferens are going to come over here and over here, and they're going to join right near the neck of the bladder, because as it is, that's the bladder, and see, they've even got the two ureters labeled, at least one there, and there's one there. Okay, so then, all these things, another thing about the accessory sex lines, they're exocrine glands. That means they make some liquid product, it goes into a duct, D-U-C-T, and it ends up in some lumen of some uh, passageway. So in this case, the first uh, accessory sex gland they've got labeled, at least here, is the seminal vesicle. That's one of the accessory sex glands in the human male. There's the old prostate gland. Okay, and it, these things are going to be adding fluid right in here, the urethra. Here's another accessory sex gland, the bulbal urethral gland. Okay, so what they're saying here is in the human male, there are three accessory sex glands. Bulbal urethral gland, seminal vesicle, and the prostate gland. Okay. They're all adding fluid at the time of ejaculation, and then of course you get the semen sample out the urethra. So semen equals sperm plus seminal plasma. Notice how that prostate, you know this is a cutaway view, but the prostate is like uh, a structure that, let, let's say this is the urethra, okay, the tube that carries the sperm and the, also the urine out of the bladder. Here's what the pro prostate looks like. It's like around the whole thing. That's dangerous. Because if it enlarges, it squeezes down the passageway. Notice how that is? And so if you get, and they do this on TV, they advertise BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy. BPH, write that down, benign, B-E-N-I-G-N. Prostatic hypertrophy. Well, lo and behold, <clears throat> benign means it's probably not cancerous. Prostate, ref prosthetic refers to the prostate, and hypertrophy is enlarging. So there's an enlarged prostate, and you might have trouble urinating, painful urination, maybe a total block sometimes. Benign prostatic hypertrophy. Because this little thing wraps around the whole urethra opening here. Anyway, that's the accessory sex glands. Adding fluid and, and nutrients, usually buffers. There's a lot of good stuff. Uh, fructose, I'm not sure if the videos say that, but fructose is what the sperm prefer as a sugar. They don't like glucose so much. Fructose or fructose. I've heard it pronounced both ways. It's a sugar, right? Carbohydrate. Sperm-like fructose. <clears throat> and so when all this stuff gets mixed together, the sperm say, oh, it's time to go to work. And they start swimming faster. Motility is greatly increased when they get the sugars and stuff. Okay? And yesterday we talked about that motility is not needed for them to get up to the oviduct, which is site of fertilization. The motility is needed to bury through, or burrow through the egg, okay? Into the egg. But you can put a little speck of carbon on the cervix and come back later and it's been carried up to the oviduct. At the estrus, right? This is all very coordinated. Great question. Old men and old dogs have trouble with prostates. Put it that way. 
And you know, years ago, and not that many years ago, there's this, I, don't, I hate to say fad, but every time a physician found an enlarged prostate, they thought it was cancerous and they did all kinds of treatments and then years passed and people said, wow, I think we overreacted. There's a lot of people out there that have had prostate surgery that probably didn't need it. I had actually a graduate student with me. This is, this is good, we're talking about the prostate. She would like more human medicine, Jennifer, God bless her soul. So she talked this drug company into giving us some drug that people were taking for enlarged prostates. Because here's the kicker, yeah, and there's a couple more points. Okay, so the prostate takes in testosterone, right? The testes make testosterone, and in the blood it would circulate all over. And the prostate takes testosterone and converts it to a more potent androgen called DHT, dihydrotestosterone, DHT, that's all capital letters. DHT is dihydrotestosterone, more powerful than testosterone. So Jennifer got this drug company to give us some drug that prevented that conversion. It inhibited the en enzyme that took T to DHT. <clears throat> and um, I can't remember now, it's so foggy, it's been long enough ago. It was, it was called Proscar. And I think we fed it, fed it or injected it, I can't remember, because it's so foggy, we did so many experiments. We did it, we, we, I think we gave it to some boars and we like, looked at the levels of testosterone. Because if you give that and testosterone is not being converted to DHT, you might get elevated blood levels of testosterone. I can't remember what she was going. She ended up in the human medicine area anyway. Okay, so that's the prostate. Okay, here's another thing though. During, uh, if you have a castrated animal, all those glands atrophy. So in a steer, they'd be hard to find. Because they all atrophy. Because they need testosterone to be functional. Because if you have a castrated animal, there's little to no testosterone, and that stimulates those glands to grow and make fluid. So if you ever dissect a bull or a boar, those glands are big and easy to find. If you dissect a barrel or a steer, you're gonna go, where are they? Okay, so they're very dependent on the presence of the testes. So great question, because it leads to a lot of things. Okay, other questions? Okay, so now let me do estrocycles. And I want to do the bovine ester cycle. And I know Aaron had some um, nice little figures up here, or at least that one. And I want to show you that because there's so many things to learn. So bovine estrus cycle. <clears throat> and there's a graph, right? So I could do that because I want to do images. Now, the one Aaron had the other day on Monday, I ran into that last night when I was doing this. And that was a horse, because remember, I think it had the estrus like five days long. So, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. I mean, look at this textbook, it's great. And I'll pick out a couple here, never seen this one before, but we'll uh, do this one. And, okay, so there's some things by convention. <clears throat> convention is usually when you see something, everybody does it the same way. Like our convention is 7% of the body weight is blood weight. You usually up at the 12 o'clock position, that's where you kind of start the ester cycle. And here at 12 o'clock, they call it day zero, because day zero sometimes is like where you start. The dominant follicle produces estrogen, which causes physical signs of heat. So I think this is, it doesn't say cow, but it, it sounds like it's a cow. So, <clears throat> At that time, there's a large follicle, <clears throat> and it never protrudes like it's showing there, but you know it does protrude a little bit. It's making estrogen. That's a family name. I think one of the, either Sarah or Aaron wrote down estradiol 17 beta, I can't remember, I think they said that Monday. That's the most powerful natural estrogen. And then you always go clockwise and tell what's happening. Because here, you should know there's things on the ovary that are characteristic. There's hormones that are characteristic. 
and things go through a cycle. So things are always changing for the cow, <coughs> but never for the bull. The bull doesn't go through any ester cycles. It's like today, you could measure hormones. Two days from now, same hormones, same relative amounts. The next week, the next week, the next week. The female side gets very complicated because hormone patterns are always changing. Then there's a pregnancy, then there could be lactation, you know, right? So it's really complicated. But if you know your stuff, then you can figure out things that might go wrong. Because I can tell you, this says a 21 day ester cycle basically. I've had cows have a nine day ester cycle. I've had cows have a 35 day ester cycle. And I know how that can happen. The standard is 21. Okay, so you have this big follicle. It's gonna rupture if things are right. Ovulate. If things aren't right, it grows bigger and you call that a cystic follicle, right? Here they're showing the egg coming out. The egg in a cow, I've seen one with my naked eye, is the size of a period at the end of the sentence. You can see it in a Petri dish if you know it's there. It's not black like a period at the end of the sentence, but you can, you can see it there. So then that A goes to the oviduct, if things are right. And this spot fills with blood. Because at ovulation, now the cow is simple, right? They only have one egg. Can you imagine in a sow? There's 16 ovulations, <coughs> pretty busy. In the cow, only one ovary usually works at a time, right? One ovulation. It might be left this time, it's never, Left, right, left, right. It never goes back and forth like that. Like, okay, it's your turn now, buddy. You know, it's not like that. It could be left, left, right, right, you know, whatever. So you got this egg going in the oviduct, and then you, this spot fills with blood. And then it's, they, they're calling this spot. And one thing I like about this diagram, everything's happening at that point. Because then this blood changes into what's called a corpus luteum. The follicle made estrogen, the corpus luteum makes progesterone. So then you have this ovary, it's mature sale produces progesterone, maintains pregnancy if the animal's pregnant. But in this case, I know the animal's not pregnant because they're showing me coming back to the cycle. If the animal was pregnant, you could draw a little line over here and say pregnancy, 284 days. And then whenever pregnancy ends, here's a secret, it always goes back to where you start growing follicles. So like right in here. So after an animal is pregnant and delivers the offspring and waits for a while, that's called postpartum period, then it jumps back in right about here. It grows another follicle. But we're going on. Maximum diameter of the corpus luteum. Then you got, if not pregnant, prostaglandin causes CL regression. That's very important. If not pregnant, the uterus releases PGF2-alpha, prostaglandin F2, and then the symbol alpha, and causes CL regression. The better way to say that is it's luteolytic. PGF2-alpha is luteolytic, L-U-T-E-O-L-Y-T-I-C, luteolytic. So if it's not pregnant, prostaglandin leaves the uterus and goes to the ovary by a special blood supply. <clears throat> that prostaglandin released from the uterus never gets back to the lungs or the heart. It goes to the ovary. It's a special way that an, an ovarian artery is wrapped around the uterine vein and there is diffusion of PGF2-alpha across from the uterine vein into the ovarian artery. <coughs> because if that prostaglandin F2-alpha had to go through the whole body and come back, it wouldn't make it because the lungs eat it. The lungs deactivate PGF2-alpha. So it's kind of smart can't go out to the circulation and come back. It's got to go directly from the uterine vein across to the ovarian artery. So then you get the decrease 
function of the CL. And notice how they've got uh, smaller circles. So that's kind of neat. And notice the position never changed. It was always the same spot where ovulation occurred. Because if that fills with blood and then changes into a corpus luteum, it's happening right there where that ovulated. And then you go around the cycle. Here. And the nice thing about cows, they do this all year round as long as nutrition is well and they're not pregnant. All year round. You can figure out how many eggs they release in a year, couldn't you? Is that three weeks? One egg per three weeks and there's 52 weeks, so you can divide 52 by three and tell me how many eggs they release in a year. And then you can tell me how many eggs, if they never got pregnant, how many eggs they release in a lifetime. And it ends up being less than 1% that are in the ovary. So in their lifetime, they will release less than 1% of all the eggs they started with as a young heifer. But if, when they're old, if you look into the ovaries, all the eggs are gone. They're gone, but they're not ovulated. So what happened is, it's called follicular atresia. There's a great loss. Supposedly, they, each ovary starts with 100,000 eggs. And they end up with nothing if they live long enough. I gotta go reset my video if it's working. <laughs> Let's see, okay, there. Okay, so what's it called? When women are out of eggs. Menopause. Menopause. And why are men involved with this? <laughs> Menopause. Keep us out of that. Okay? It's disgusting. It should have some other name. <laughs> Sarah and I should work on that. What can we call it other than menopause? Because like, okay, it's like, we have nothing to do with this. Anyway, when you run out of eggs, you have menopause. But most of our domestic animals never live that long, right? They, if they don't milk enough, then they're shipped out, right? They're cold and something happens. So very seldom do you have any domestic animal that has no eggs in their ovary because they don't live that long to waste them all. But almost all, nine, more than 99% are lost in the ovary. They disintegrate. Because when a female heifer is born, if you can take those ovaries out, you can count all the eggs she has and she never has any more. They start with X and they always go lower. The male, on the other hand, keeps making sperm forever. I mean, you still see those old 80-year-old guys in the uh, newspaper, like when you buy groceries, you catch up on all that news there in those magazines. You know, an 88-year-old man marries a 25-year-old actress or something, right? They're still making sperm, okay? Anyway, anybody got any questions on that <clears throat> before we talk about maybe some abnormal estrous cycles? Have that too, where it would be less than 1% of the eggs in the Yeah, yeah, all animals basically. Yeah, all, you never ovulate all those eggs. Because you know, you could figure out, you could, for a cow, you could figure out, let's say she lives 15 years, which is, it'd be really hard to find a 15 year old cow, but you could find it. And if she never got pregnant, you know she released one egg every three weeks of her life. You could figure out how many, it's 15 times 52, right, divided by three, that would tell you how many eggs she released, and it's, less than 1% of what she started with. There's this great loss. And it's, you might say, well, they were all, um, they weren't healthy eight. Yeah, they were, a lot of them were very healthy. They were just lost. Okay, so now let me tell you about abnormally short ester cycles and abnormally long ester cycles. Because this is a textbook, round and around and around. And when you're out there on with animals, some of them haven't read the textbook. So let me tell you about the heifer, or it might have been a cow, that had a nine-day ester cycle. So here's what happened to her. Now, I'm, we used to do experiments where we stayed up all night watching these animals, so everybody had a little uh, uh, schedule, I guess. <clears throat> so a cow came into heat. I can't remember if it was a cow or a heifer. It doesn't matter. And we were taking blood samples, so we know we know the blood patterns of hormones so we can like it's not like we have to be, depend solely on the behavior 
But then she came back in the heat nine days later. So here's what happened to her. <clears throat> she ovulated, formed a CL, but then the uterus said, I'm irritated. I'm going to release prostaglandin F2 alpha now. And so on day right in here, the uterus released prostaglandin F2 alpha, killed that CL, and then it went back up there. So it's like she did this, and then she went back there. Nine days. So the uterus, if it's irritated, can cause a short ester cycle. Or you can buy prostaglandin F2 alpha, and if a cow was in heat nine days ago, and you want to kill the CL, you inject her with PGF2 alpha. You kill this, and you go back here. PGF2 alpha only works if there's an active CL on the ovary. If you injected PGF2 alpha up here, no effect. There's no CL to kill. It's got to be a fully formed CL. Okay, so there's only certain stages of the ester cycle where prostaglandin 2 alpha works. Would the PGF2 alpha um, like abort a pregnancy? Absolutely. Yeah, good question. Yeah, the CL in the cow, and this gets, remember how we gloss things over by doing average things? <clears throat> Sometimes you can have an over, and they've done this, a pregnant animal and take the ovaries out. And they do that because then you can say, are the ovaries necessary at this stage of gestation? Because here's the little kicker. Remember, progesterone makes, uh, the CL makes progesterone, and that helps pregnancy. But in some animals, the placenta also makes progesterone enough that you can take the ovaries out and it won't abort. But you gotta be careful, it depends on the animal. There's a, so, sometimes, I can't remember the cow if it's, I think it's like two, they need the CL two thirds of the way through pregnancy, and then after that they don't, but every animal is different. Some animals need that CL the whole time. But let's say, let's say you have a cow that's 90 days pregnant, and you like accidentally give her the prostaglandin F2 alpha, whereas you should have done that cow, you're gonna cause an abortion, yeah. And then of course, we've already talked about, so you could abort a cow with PGF2 alpha, but we already talked about another drug that could cause abortion in any animal. What was that drug? Weeks ago. RU486, a world famous progesterone antagonist. Now the reason that would cause abortion in everything because then it's gonna work against progesterone coming from the CL and progesterone coming from the placenta, right? The PGF2 alpha only kills the CL. So if there's progesterone from another source, it won't cause an abortion. Or if you have an animal that is treasured and you think it might abort because it's not making enough progesterone itself, you can put progesterone in an implant and put it under the skin and give her more progesterone. Okay, so I talked about the short ester cycle. Why? The, the uterus is irritated. Not necessarily infected, but irritated. <clears throat> so now, how can a cow have a 35-day ester cycle? Here's what happens with that. Right here, if it says, if not pregnant, prostaglandin F2 alpha causes CL regression. If the uterus is full of pus, this does not happen. A pus-filled uterus cannot release PGF2 alpha. Now, I'm talking about cows, right? Remember. It's all kind of cows. So if you don't release prostaglandin F2 alpha into the circulation, into that uterine vein, then you get retention of the CL until the infection clears up. A pus-filled uterus is called pyometria. Pyometra, I should say. Pyometra. P-Y-O-M-E-T-R-A. A cow with pyometra will have an extended ester cycle because the CL is being retained longer than normal in the non-pregnant animal. And here's the kicker. Every time a cow starts a CL, right here, the CL does not know how long it's gonna live. 
so it packs for the long trip. And the long trip is the length of pregnancy. So every CL ever formed says, I'm going on a trip that takes 284 days. <coughs> Unbeknownst to it, if the uterus is going to send out prostaglandin 2 alpha, it doesn't live that long. So you could do a hysterectomy in a cow, right at this stage right here. So you take out the uterus, you take out the source of prostaglandin F2 alpha, right? But leave the ovaries in, that CL lives the length of pregnancy, 284 days. So CLs don't know how long they're going to live, so they always pack for the long trip. They're always ready to live 284 days in the cow. Kind of amazing. So if you have a pus-filled uterus and it doesn't resolve, you can have months <coughs> where nothing happens. The CL is retained. Why is it retained? Because it can live for 284 days. So what are the best treatments for pyometra? Inject prostaglandin F2 alpha. Because the CL then will die. And then the cow will think, oh, I'm going to do this again. Grow a follicle. And that causes uterine contractions, and then that helps get the pus out. OK? Very interesting. But estrous cycles, you know, most textbooks don't talk about all these abnormal things. But they can be 9 days. They can be 12 days. They can be 100 days long. <coughs> And it's all hidden, isn't it? You can't tell what's going on unless you're good at palpation, right? You can say, oh, the cow's cystic, or this uterus is abnormal, or you can do a membrane slip and say, oh, there's a pregnancy here. <coughs> okay, now, <coughs> hmm, I want to start patterns, and then that's, when we get together tomorrow, I want to do some more patterns, but let me show this. Okay. Now, this is that horse one, but it, it's, it's okay. We'll pretend it's a cow because the only difference is the length of estrus. All the hormone patterns are the same in the horse and the cow. So they've got ovulation, it's day zero. Notice now we don't have a clock, we have a linear line, but it's, it's a clock, right? It repeats itself, there's zero over here, zero again over here. So if this was a cow, it's 21 days. In fact, in the horse, it's also 21 days. The problem with the horse is they don't always do this, right? They're seasonal breeders. They're long day breeders. So they do this during the long days, but in October, they're not doing this. But ovulation is there. <clears throat> the green line is LH, and here's the kicker. You have to have a, like a spike of LH to cause ovulation. And that doesn't really show the spike very good. Others will draw like a big spike. It's called a surge release of LH. Without the surge, you get no ovulation. It's got to be this surge. So that's not shown very well in this one. But notice estrogen is in blue and it was rising here because when it goes like that, that means the follicle is getting bigger. You have to have a big follicle to ovulate, so how do you get a big follicle? Just grow it. And most horses ovulate one, too, so it's not really bad. So you grow a big follicle, and LH surges. Then when the follicle, even before ovulation, the follicle is going to decrease some estrogen production. But this estrogen did a couple things. It went to the uterus and said, contract, to help carry sperm. But it also went to the brain and said, act like you're in heat. Notice, during when estrogen is high, progesterone is low. Because if you have high progesterone, you don't get heat. Progesterone is anti-heat. So if progesterone was high here, even when the follicle is growing, the cow or the horse would not show heat because progesterone is anti-heat. Progesterone says, it's a pregnancy hormone, right? Don't act crazy, act quiet, we're pregnant. So progesterone is low, but after ovulation, remember the CL forms in that spot. 
progesterone is being made, and some place along the line, PGF2 alpha, you know, they have A there, but it's really alpha, the symbol alpha. And look at, there it is, and that's coming from the uterus. But it could come from you if you want to, right? <coughs> because you could give PGF2 alpha right here, and as long as the CL is active, you'll kill the CL. Okay, so you could have the, the horse or the cow come in the heat sooner. Uh, what's this? FSH is kind of blase. FSH helps the follicles grow, but this is very good. Estrogen growing, LA to cause the ovulation. Progesterone is there, but when progesterone is present, we usually can't have heat, even in the face of estrogen. See tomorrow in um, math, Moose is coming back. We love it so much that when we asked uh, his dad or dad or whatever, he's coming back.